Are we having fun yet? Yes. Now comes the funnest time of all. Pastor Joe, come on up here. Let's give Pastor Joe a big hand. Yay! As I said concerning Pastor Joe, we've known each other for, I don't know, 12 years, something like that. And we've been investing in uh, his organization over in India. Wait till you hear his heart and all that he has for the people over there. And he has so many different satellite type things. Tell everyone about all that you've been doing over there. Sure. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It's uh, such a joy to be here this morning. And I just want to bring greetings to each of you in the name of our master Yeshua from our community in India, Kehilat Bethlehem. Now, our community is uh, based out of a scripture that is uh, from Isaiah chapter 58, verse 12, where it says that those from among you will rebuild ancient ruins, you will raise up age-old foundations, and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. The restorer of breaches or the ancient pathways, I believe with all of my heart, is restoring people or the nations back to the Torah, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's what we as a community are involved with. If you see on the PowerPoint, the first picture is a few people of our community. Not everyone, just a few. We are a community that basically loves Yeshua, the Messiah, and His commandments. And we believe that salvation is by grace through faith as it is revealed in the Torah. This, uh, the, the place where we are standing right now is a rented facility that we have rented out as commercial space. We used to meet in our house for more than 10 years, uh, week after week. But then just before COVID, the building that we were living in, basically what the landlord wanted to sell it and we were not able to purchase it. So we lost the building. And we, by faith, basically took up a new commercial space. To give you the numbers of, of the rent, the house we lived in, we used to pay $200. And the commercial space, we are paying $2,500. So it's a huge step of faith we had to take because uh, that's where we needed a space for. So our vision is basically to educate and train the body of Messiah into maturity to usher in the messianic age. But you do that by training, nurturing disciples of Yeshua. And first thing we do is we focus on the next generation. Next generation is the Torah school. The focus of the Torah school is to teach the Torah to young disciples of Yeshua. The children are discipled and trained to take on the baton ushering the messianic reign. I don't know how many of you know anything about India. India has 1.4 billion people. And out of the 1.4 billion people, we are in our city about 80, you know, uh, 10 to 15 million people. The main religion in India is Hinduism. Today, the government of India wants to make Hinduism a major educational for every edu uh, institution. So right now, we are right now focusing on having a new focus with the children to help them uh, get uh, education and Torah learning together. We are also focused on training pastors. We are prepared, training about 20 to 30 pastors from the villages. Many of these pastors come from non-English speaking background. They come for our workshops, weekly classes, basically to help them uh, to understand the messianic vision. These pastors are basically facing a lot of persecution through anti-Semitic uh, believers and, and Jewish anti-missionaries also. So it is, we, we've taken up a huge task upon this. Great men of God, poor communities, but we also have to take care of their physical needs. We, another one, the other project that we are involved with is called Yad Rakamim, which is basically uh, Hands of Mercy. It's, uh, where it's an initiative where we basically feed the hungry. We cook, we pack, and we distribute about 100 to 100 meal packages in our city to the poor on the streets of our city. Then after this, we are also involved with this mission called Sparsh. The, he, the word Sparsh is a Hindi word, which basically means touch. All these children in this, in this home, it's a rescue home. Our children are basically coming from 
who are born out of prostitution in the red light area. These children, if they're going to be there in the red light area with their mother, at the age of 8 or 10, they basically get sold. The man in the uh, red t-shirt and red shorts is a friend whose name is Timothy. He's the one who runs the place and takes care of all these children. So if you see the next picture, uh, there are boys, there are girls. The youngest over there right now is a two-year-old girl who we have taken out. We basically give them a better hope, get a better future, help them to see something better. If you look at the next picture, the small girl in the blue T-shirt is basically the girl by the name Pyle. She was one of our earlier uh, girls who we had today. She's grown up and she's now a stewardess in a leading airline company in India. This is what we are doing in terms of that project. Finally, we also have a school, a children's home. It used to be a children's home, but the government wanted to get involved and do something, so we had to rename it into after-school centers. Today, we have nearly 25 after-school centers with about 20 to 25 children in each of these places. The aim is to empower children from the very poor uh, backgrounds basically to help them have a better future. We help them with education and providing basic nourishment and basic refreshments. So the question is how you can help. Number one, you can help by praying. Number two, if you have a dream, you want to dream along with us. Remember, 1.4 billion people. You can dream along with us and invest in the future of the nation of India. You can partner with us. Or else if you're looking at coming as a mission trip, doing some work in India, you're also welcome to come. So these are the links for our website, Facebook. We have a few brochures. I don't know if it's still available. I have two with me. If, if you have not got a chance, uh, you are welcome to come and take it from me after the service. Amen. Every time we come to Seattle is to come to El Shaddai. El Shaddai is like home. Pastor Mark has been uh, a tower of help a tower of support for all these years. It started many years ago when I used to be an Assemblies of God pastor for many years. And when we started getting into the Hebrew roots of our faith, all of a sudden things started to change in our cities and we started to get branded, we felt alone. And we basically called one day Pastor Mark and he told us that, don't worry, we are here. And from if I'm not wrong, from the year 2011, 2012, he's been standing with us. He's been as our pastor over us. And we really appreciate Pastor Mark El Shaddai Ministries and especially each and every one of you. Because of you, we are able to do what God is calling us to do. And we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. This morning, I want to take a little time to talk about this, this week's Torah portion. We are in Pasha Kiddushim. I know Pastor Mark has already told, spoken a lot about this Pasha, but I'm not going to take a lot of time about it. Pasha Kiddushim talks about the laws of holiness. It broadens out from the world of the sanctuary and priests to that of the Israelites as a whole, commanding them to be holy because God says, I am the Lord, I, the Lord your God, am holy. And the opening chapter of contains the famous holiness code with its command to love the neighbor, the stranger, as well as other laws more ritual in character. And the second half of the Torah portion basically deals with forbidden sexual relations and other forbidden uh, uh, pagan practices. I don't know if you have observed, but this week's Torah portion, just two chapters, have 78 commandments, 78 mitzvot that God's word commands us to do. But I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all the 78 this morning. I want to talk about the concept of love or the logic of love. There's this man who's written a book called Love, a History by the name of Simon May. Simon May says, if love in the Western world has a founding text, that text is Hebrew. Very interesting. One text in the Torah is famous above all other the phrase from this week's Torah portion where we find in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 where it says that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The great rabbi, Rabbi Akiva said the love is the greatest principle of the Torah. The rule of justice is common in moral codes. 
the first moral judgment a child tends to make is what? It's not fair. Justice as fairness is common. What is distinctively uncommon is the idea which is born in Judaism and which is adopted by Christianity that love is the central virtue of the moral life. It is remarkable how rarely this simple truth has been acknowledged. For many centuries, Christians taught that the God of the Old Testament was the God of love and retribution, while the God of the New Testament was a God of love and forgiveness, despite the fact that Christians believed him to be the same God. Whenever we hear, love your neighbor, we think is mentioned in the New Testament, it's always very clearly a quotation from the Torah itself. Yet to this day, if you look up or encounter the quote, love your neighbor as yourself, more than often than not, you will find it attributed to what? To the New Testament and not to the Torah. Most perversely still, there is often criticism of priestly legalism, despite the fact that the command to love your neighbor appears in the most important priestly text of all, which is Leviticus 19 of this week's Torah portion. It is, it, is pre, it is precisely the Torah Kohanim or the law of the priest that tells us what? To love our neighbors. Indeed, priestly consciousness is suffused with love. The Hebrew word for the book of Leviticus is the word Vayikra. Vayikra, if you have been learning under Pastor Mark, you would know Vayikra basically means to call, to beckon, or in other words, it is a summoning, it is a calling of love. Whenever God is mentioned in the context of sacrifice, whenever God is mentioned in the book of Leviticus, the supreme uh, priestly act, he's, only, uh, he's always described with a four-letter name of Hashem, Yudke Vavke, which basically signals the Midat Rakamim, or the attribute of mercy, love, and compassion. Simon May, listen to what Simon May says in his book, Love, A History. He says, the widespread belief that the Hebrew Bible is all about vengeance and an eye for an eye, while the gospel supposedly invent love as an unconditional and universal value, must therefore count as one of the most extraordinary misunderstandings in all of Western history. For the Hebrew Bible is the source, not just of the two love commandments, but of a larger moral vision inspired by wonder for love's power. Indeed, Leviticus chapter 19 teaches a third love also. In addition of that of loving God and loving your neighbor, it says in Leviticus 19:33 and 34 that if a stranger dwells with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. It's easy to love your neighbor as yourself because throughout most of history, your neighbors were most often like yourself in terms of culture, in terms of class, in terms of nationality, and in terms of ethnicity, you live together. That's why if you see people coming from different countries also, they live in groups together, so it's easy to love from your own culture. The challenge is basically to love the stranger, the one who is not like you. But the Torah's approach to love goes deeper than this, as we can see, that if you look at the famous phrase, but at the context of which it is said, it says over there in Leviticus 19, 17 through 18, do not hate your brother in your heart. You must admonish your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. Do not take revenge, nor bear a grudge against the children of your people. You must love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. In fact, the Torah in this verse does not begin with the command uh, to love. Instead, it starts with the hard case. And what's the hard case? What to do with a neighbor or a brother whom you dislike or even hate. 
he may have harmed you. He may have offended you. He may have insulted you. He may have acted in a way that you deeply believe is wrong. Your hatred, let us say, is not irrational. The question is, what do you do in such a case? To, the, to command blatantly that you must strifle your feelings is naive. It is also unlikely to be effective in the, in the long run. Sigmund Freud coined the phrase, the, the return of the repressed to signal that feelings we concisely hide or deny have a way of returning in full and destructive force. What we hide is possible to come back. Hence, the second phrase in this week's Torah portion, which we just read, is that you must admonish your neighbor. Instead of silencing your feelings, you have to verbalize them. You have to confront the person honestly and openly. But before doing that, you have to apply the principle of forgiveness. Apply the principle of repentance. Because without doing so and talking to a people, you can basically talk in anger, frustration, irritation. And instead of resolving the problem, you can basically cause the matter to go out of hand and unreconcilable. So it's very important to learn to first forgive. I like the words of the commentator Rambam, Maimonides, in his Mishnah Torah. See what he says. He says, when one person sins against another, the latter should not hate him and remain silent. As it is said about the wicked, he's basically quoting from uh, Samuel, and Absalom spoke to Ammon neither good or evil, although, and although Absalom hated Am Amnon. Rather, he commanded to speak to him and say to him, why did you do such and such to me? Why did you sin against me in such and such a manner? As it is said, you must surely admonish your neighbor. If he repents and requests forgiveness from him, he must forgive and not be cruel. In the seminal, similar vein, another commentator by the name, the Ramban, Nakmanides, in his commentary to Leviticus 19.17, this is what he says. He says, it seems to me that the correct interpretation is that the expression, you shall surely remonstrate is to be understood in the same way as in the phrase Abraham remonstrated with Avimelech. The face is the verse is thus saying, do not hate your brother in your heart when he does something to you against your will, but instead you should remonstrate with him saying, why did you do this to me? And you will not bear sin because of him by covering up your hatred in your heart and not telling him. For when you remonstrate with him, he will justify himself before you so that you will have no cause to hate him or he will regret his action and admit his sin and you will forgive him. Which is really, really powerful. Which also reminds me of another commentator, I would not say commentator, the words of our master Yeshua in the gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, 43 to 48, where he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, what should I do? Love your enemy, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of the Father of your Father in heaven. Why? For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do you not know even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect or you shall be holy just as your Father in heaven is holy and perfect. In the beginning of the service, we said the Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 6 verse 12, it says, one of the things in the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And in the last part in 14 and 15 of Matthew 6, it says, if you forgive men their trespasses, what will happen? Your heavenly father will also forgive you. 
So in other words, if we want to receive God's forgiveness, it's a condition, it's based upon us if we are willing to forgive those who have offended us. It's, very, it's a very, very difficult thing. And then he says, but if you do not forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. So it's all up to us if we want to. Many of times, we want God to be merciful to us. We want God to be kind to us. We want God to be compassionate to us. But we are not willing to show that same mercy, compassion, and kindness to our fellow brother or our fellow neighbor or our, the, someone who has offended us. That's why we see many people going through a lot of difficulty. I like the scripture where it says in Matthew 18. Yeshua goes on to say Matthew 18. He says, moreover, if your brother commits a sin against you, what should you do? Go and show him his fault. But what? Privately, just between the two of you. Isn't that what the scripture is what we read just now in Leviticus also talking about? The philosophy many of us have in our world or the Western philosophy is that it's none of my business. Why should I be bothered? It's, I don't have to be bothered about it. It's his problem. It's his life. But if you claim to be believers in Yeshua, if you claim to be believers, uh, believe in, in, in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is the law of the land. This is the law of the Torah. This is what God expects of us. This is what it means to live in the light. See what it says over there. If he listens to you, you have won him back because it's all about returning the person back into the house of God. If he doesn't listen to you, take one or two others with you so that every accusation can be supported by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to hear you, tell the congregation. If he refuses to listen even to the congregation, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Not forever. In the end, it's not to treat him like that forever because in the end, God wants nobody to perish. He wants everybody to come back to repentance. The faster someone repents or returns to him, there is great rejoicing in heaven. We all know the parable in Luke chapter 15 about the, the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the last parable, we all know it as the prodigal son. But you know what? The last story, in fact, is not about the son. The last story is about the father. How do I know? Because the parable does not talk about there was a son. It says there was a father. It talks about how loving the father is. It's about the father calling the people back. It goes on to say in uh, Matthew 18, Peter, he came up to his rabbi, which is Yeshua, and he said, How often can my brother sin against me? And I, forg and I have to forgive him. As many as seven times. No, not seven times answered Yeshua, but 70 times seven. You know, 70 times seven is 490 times to the same person for the same offense. He may never ever correct and he will do it again tomorrow. So in other words, forgiveness is not for the other person. Forgiveness is for me so that I would not remain in a prison. So that I would be set free, so that I would live a life according to the scriptures and live a life of faithfulness and fullness of joy so that the name of God and the name of Yeshua may be glorified. And then he goes on to say, because of this, he goes on to talk about a parable, a very powerful parable when you read it in context. He says, because of this, the kingdom of heaven may be compared with a king who decided to settle accounts with his deputies. Right away, they brought forward a man who owed him many millions. And since he couldn't pay, his master ordered that he, his wife, his children, and all his possessions be sold to pay the debt. But what happened? The servant fell down before him and he said, be, be patient, salva nuth. He begged him and I will pay back everything. So out of pity for him, the master let him go and forgave the debt. Verse 28 goes on to say, And as that servant was leaving, he came upon one of his fellow servants who owed him some tiny sum. He grabbed him, began to choke him, crying, Pay back what you owe me. His fellow servant fell before him and begged, Be patient with me and I will pay you back. But what happened? He refused. Instead, he had him thrown in jail until he should repay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were extremely distressed. They went and told their master everything that had, had taken place. Then the master summoned the servant and said, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt just because you begged me to do it. 
Shouldn't you have had pity on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And then it goes on to say, and in anger, his master turned him over to the jailers for punishment until he paid everything he owed. And it concludes by what? This is how our heavenly father will treat you unless you each forgive your brother from your heart. When we talk about the tormentors, many people live lives of tormenting, stressful, bitter, rejected, abandoned lives. Many people live with negative thinking. What is negative thinking? Negative thinking is nothing but depression. You go to the doctor, he gives you a pill. The pill basically takes care of the symptoms, but he has not taken care of the heart issue. So what should I do? Go to God, repent, let go. It's easier to let go, but something within me, my ego won't allow me to let go. They will look at me as if I'm a failure. It doesn't matter. They looked at him as it is a failure. He gave up his life so that you and I would be redeemed. And if we are called to be disciples of Yeshua, I believe we need to live like him, portray to the world what it means, what our rabbi, what our master is. In the earlier portion by the, the Rambam, the Maimonides, he his example of why remonstration is necessary. Now, the word remonstration is the act of expressing earnest opposition or protest to say plead or, or, or some kind of objection is necessary. And he brings up a story of David's two sons, which is based out of 2 Samuel 13, of how Ammon, one of David's king, uh, David's children, raped his half-sister Tamar. When Absalom Tamar's brother hears about the episode, his reaction seems on the face very serene, very quiet. See what it says over there in 2 Samuel 13. Her brother Absalom said to her, has that Ammon, your brother, been with you? Shh, don't talk. Don't tell anybody. Be quiet my, now, my sister. He's your brother. Don't take this to heart. Don't, don't talk about it. Don't tell anybody about it. And then the scripture goes on to say, Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house as a desolate woman, a wounded woman. And King David heard about this. He was, he was furious. Absalom never said a word to Ammon, neither good nor bad. Now, many of times we also don't say anything. Appearances, however, are deceptive. Absalom was anything but forgiving. His silence was not a sign that he forgave his brother. He waited for two years and he invited Amnon to a festive meal at a sheep sharing time. And he gave instructions to his men. Listen to the instructions of Absalom. He said, listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, I say to you, strike Amnon down and then kill him. And this is what happened. Absalom's silence was not the silence of forgiveness but his silence was the silence of hate. The hate of which Pierre, the, uh, which wrote a famous line, revenge is a di dish best served cold. Revenge is a dish best served cold. Many of times we also live lives like that. We claim to be believers, but inside we hate, we have revenge. In the opposite side, the Ramban, the Nakmanides, gives an example of a case talking about Abraham, Abraham, how he succeeded in his path of encountering or talking to somebody who has done something wrong to him. The servants of Avimelech, the king of Gerar, had seized possessions of it. And he says over there in Genesis 21, 25 through 26, Abraham rebuked Avimelech because of a well of water which Avimelech's servants had seized. And Avimelech said, I do not know who has done this. You did not tell me, nor had I heard of it until today. What happened in the end of this? The two men basically made a covenant to avoid such situations in the future. In fact, there is actually a powerful example in the, in the scripture, which is neither one of these men, I, neither of, uh, of, of Abraham or Absalom, but another story concerning Joseph and his brothers. 
It says in Genesis chapter 37, verses 3 to 4. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other sons. Why? Because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. That's what many English translation says. But the Hebrew says literally, they could not speak with him in peace. Many of times we are not able to speak to one another in peace. We are not able to show our face in peace. If we, some, we see a fellow brother or sister coming our way, we want to divert our attention and go in another way. We don't want to show our eyes to them. We don't want them to see us. We want to avoid them. Why? Because there's something wrong in our heart. To this verse in Genesis 37, Rabbi Jonathan, he comments in his commentary to Genesis 37 verse 4. Had they been able to sit, sit together as a group, they would have spoken to one another and talked about it with each other and would eventually have made their peace with one another. The problem is we are not willing to look at the face and tell one another, you know, what you did offended me. What you shared disturbed me. Is this what you mean? It's very hard to bring out our emotions. We want to be the good person. We don't want to be the person who irritates the other. We want to avoid the person. We want to avoid problems. But friends, that's what the community is all about. The power of the community is to look at each other, share with one another, because we are stronger together, weaker when we are alone. The tragedy of con conflict is that it prevents people from talking together and listening to one another. A failure of communication is often the prelude to revenge. The inner logic of these verses in Leviticus 19, of these two verses in this week's Torah portion, is therefore this. Love your neighbor as yourself. But not all neighbors are in fact lovable. There are those who out of envy or malice have done you harm. I do not command you to live as if you were angels without any of the emotional nature, natu emotional emotions natural to human beings. I do, however, forbid you to hate. This is why when someone does you wrong, you must confront the wrongdoer. But before you confront the wrongdoer, it's important to forgive the wrongdoer. Because when you forgive the wrongdoer and then confront, your confrontation is not out of revenge, but it is out of love. It is out of compassion. It is from a perspective of God. You must tell him or her of your feelings of hurt and distress. Why? It's not to separate because it's, it is all about coming together being in unity. It, it may be that you misunderstood him or it may be that he genuinely meant to do you harm. But now faced with the reality of the injury that he or she has done to you, he or she may sincerely repent of what he did. If however, you fail to talk through, there is a real possibility that you will bear a grudge and in the fullness of time, you will come and take the revenge just like Absalom took a revenge upon his brother. So what is impressive about the Torah is that it both articulates the highest of ideals and at the same time speaks to us as human beings. If we were angels, it would be easy to love one another. But the fact is, we are not angels. An ethic that commands us to love our neighbors without any hint as to how we are to achieve it is unlivable. Instead, the Torah sets out a realistic program. And what is that realistic program? Be honest with one another. Talking things through. We may be able to achieve reconciliation. Not always to be sure, but often it comes to reconciliation. How much distress and even bloodshed might be spared if humanity or each of us heeded or listened to the simple command in this week's Torah portion. We just come out of Pesach. We are in the Sefirat Omer or the counting of the Omer. The counting, we are counting up towards Shavuot 50 days. These 50 days are known as the days of judgment. 
These 50 days are known that we need to take time of not being busy with other activities, but focusing on our character building, building of our faith, building of our trust, and making sure our character is in, to, in, in the same way as the character of God, or in the ways of God as it is in Exodus 33 and 34. Just before Pesach, we celebrate another festival. It's called Purim. In fact, Purim in, Exa, in Esther chapter 4. The scripture says in Esther chapter 4 that when Mordecai heard of the evil decree that was going to come to his, him and his people, the, the scripture says that Mordecai rendered, tore his clothes and he put ash and he started to fast and he began to scream. He began to yell, making it, it was forbidden to do such things in front of the king's gate. He didn't care about what was the order of the day or the order of nature, but he began to cry out, yelling unto God and causing people to know that he is in sadness, great sadness. Even telling his own uh, 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 sis, uh, sister, Esther, it's for you to do something. There is another man in the book of Genesis because he failed to receive a blessing from his father. He also began to cry. Who is this man? He's Esau. Same words in Hebrew. Almost just in English, you don't find the difference. But in Hebrew, there's a small difference. Here in Esther, Mordecai is crying because the plans of God, the, 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 the work of God, the kingdom of God is not being fulfilled. Whereas in the book of Genesis, Esau is crying because the plans of God are being fulfilled. What God's kingdom is going to come to pass. One is crying because the kingdom of God is not going to come. Another is crying because the kingdom of God is going to be manifested. The sages say that the first exile took place of three revealed sins. Idolatry, idol worship, bloodshed and forbidden relationships. Because the sin was revealed, the exile would be revealed. And as the Jewish people, after the destruction of the first temple, as they were leaving Jerusalem and going into Babylon, Jeremiah was there and Jeremiah said unto them, 70 years and you will return. 67 years later, the whole incident of Purim took place. And in the 70th year, they returned back, made a U-turn and returned to Jerusalem, just like Jeremiah promised, just like God told them. Because of three open revealed sins, the exile was also revealed. The sages also go on to say, the second temple, which also was destroyed on the same day as the first temple, which was destroyed because of only one sin. It's called in Hebrew, sinat kinam, which basically means baseless hatred. Hating a person for no reason. This sin of hating a person for no reason is a sin which is not revealed. You do not know if I hate you or not. I can smile at you and say, how are you? Or praise the Lord. Or if you're into the Jewish movement, you would say, Baruch Hashem. But you look great today, but in your heart, you cannot stand them. You, 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 you don't know if I like you or not. That, my friend, my brother, my sister, is a hidden sin. The U.S. friendship with Israel came a couple of weeks ago crashing down. Today also it's not anywhere but better. Hours after the United States policy of friendship with Israel collapses on the floor of the UN Security Council, Baltimore's famous Francis Scott Key Bridge, named for, for the man who penned the US national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, is hit by a ship, collapsed into the river. Is that an irony? It is no irony. God is trying to bring our attention. Remember the earthquake that takes, took place in New Jersey and the New York area. Later on, the lightning that struck, struck uh, the Statue of Liberty. If you've also read, you've been hearing about the solar eclipse. The scriptures are very clear that the sun, moon, and stars are what? They're signs. They're signals. Movadim, seasons, years. For whom? Not for the non-believers, but for the believers. The Torah, the Bible is not for the heathen. It's not for the Gentile. It's not for somebody who does not know the God of Abraham. It is for everyone who claims to be a believer through Messiah to, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
So all these things that are happening around us are what? Warning, signals from whom? God, for what? For us to hear his voice. He wants us to listen. He's trying to get our attention. The question is, are, is he getting our attention? Look at what is happening in your universities. Look at what is happening around you. These are your children. This is the next generation. The question is, what are you going to do? You can stand there and say, it's none of my business. Or you can say, God, you have placed me in this nation for such a time like this. You want me to do something. Maybe I don't know what to do. But the best thing I can do, I can start to come together, reconcile with my brother and my sister. It's time for me, oh God. And I can pray together. There are many messianic moments, many Hebrew roots moments in this city, in this, in this nation. But many of us, we don't like each other. We don't want to see each other. We don't want to talk about each other. Isn't that, isn't that such idolatry? Isn't that sin? In my words, according to the scriptures, I think it's wrong. We need to be peacekeepers. We need to be like sons of Aharon who wanted to make peace for one another. Why? Peace is not about building my kingdom. Peace is about building the kingdom of God. Peace is about kingdom. It's about King Yeshua. It's about us returning back to Jerusalem and causing him to be seated on the throne. Today we have a lot of Torah going on. All throughout in the internet like never before. You have channel after channel after channel of people studying Torah, teaching Torah, teaching Torah. We have a lot of kindness. We have a lot of chesed in our generation. We people are doing a lot of we feed the poor, we take care of this thing or that need. We're doing so many things. But one thing we are missing is that we cannot stand each other. Hidden sin. Hate without a cause. So what's the point, my friends, of a lot of Torah if we cannot stand each other? Or what's the point of giving so much of charity, a lot of poor being fed, but we have no unity. We have no love for each other. We need to learn to love each other. We need to learn to shine with one another. If we argue with each other, if we hate each other, we don't like each other, our light will never shine. There is no light in us because it's not about our light. It's the light of Mashiach in us. Our job is what? Is to shine in the world. What did our master, what did our rabbi say? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. Is your light shining so much that people are seeing your good works and glorifying your father? It's not about you. The only way we can have our light to be shining is by coming together in unity. Stopping us, putting aside all this nonsense of backbiting and hatred within our hearts. And coming to a place that we can come together in unity. Purim was all about a decree that was made by Haman the wicked who wanted to kill us. Do you know how Mordecai was able to overcome or cancel the decree? Besides the fasting, besides the Torah learning, you know what he did? He got the people together. He got everybody united. And when the people came together in unity, together, immediately the decree was reversed. You read, up, you read also about the story of Jonah. What, what does the scripture say? Jonah says, in three days, you're going to be destroyed. He never tells them to, to repent. He doesn't tell them to fast. But the people of that generation had the spiritual cognizance. They were able to listen to the voice of God, to the prophet Jonah. And they recognized that voice. And what did they do? They selflessly on their own made everyone in that nation to begin to cry out. They put on ash cloths and began to fast and pray. And what happened? The decree was reversed. Generations later, the next generation failed to learn from their ancestors. Friends, the United Nations, the nations of the world are in a very critical point of history. It might look dangerous. It might be looking difficult. But the question is, we have a choice this morning. On the Shabbat, the choice is, are we going to follow like our ancestors and say, God, we're going to pay the price and do whatever it takes to get this nation back. If it makes, if it is necessary for me to reconcile with somebody, I will make that happen. If it for me to intercede for somebody, I will make that happen. Why? Because we want to get our nation back. Because it's not about us. It's about the next generation. We don't have Mordecai. 
what we have each of us. We must do it ourselves. We need to understand that we can only win darkness if we are united. The enemy is united in making sure the United Nations and the nations of the world be destroyed. Just think about how powerful it will be if we come together in unity. The enemy has no chance, no power, because Adonai Savaoth is with us. And what is unity? I love you. I appreciate you. I respect you. I will make space for you. I will make room for you. Even though you look different, even though you pronounce words differently, even though you dress differently, even though you come with your customs or culture from wherever you come from, we will learn to love and accept each other in the way they are. Esther chapter 4, what did Esther say in the end? Fast, pray for me. God has made me in this season, in a time like this. Esther was willing to pay the price for unity, love, and de deliverance. The question this morning on the Shabbat, Hashem is asking El Shaddai Ministries. He's asking each of you sitting here. He's asking everyone who is watching me online, what are you going to do? Many of, many of the nations who are watching El Shaddai Ministries have been blessed by the teachings of this, of this ministry based out of the United States. It is time. You might not be here, but you can come together in prayer, in battle, in spiritual battle to stand against the forces of evil which wants to destroy this nation. The first commandment that God gave us after receiving the Torah was what? That we are to be a light to the nations. It says in Exodus, if you obey my voice, keep my covenant, then you shall be my own treasure among all the peoples. And when you are my own treasure among the peoples, Hashem says that you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nations. How will we, we be the light? Not when we are separated. When we are separated, why would the nations come and ask, which God do we serve? We need to show the nations we are united. Because when we are united, the nations will come and say, I want to know the God that you serve. People in India, people in Pakistan, people in Middle East, people of where is going through a lot of oppression are looking for the light. The United Nations have an opportunity. If we fight together, the Shekinah of God will not be with us. But if we are together in love and unity, the Shekinah of God is with us. The scripture says in 2 Chronicles 7, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face and turn from their wickedness. The question is, are we willing to turn from the wickedness first from our hearts? The baseless hatred from our hearts. Reconcile with one another. It's easy, friends, to divide. There's a price to pay to stay in unity. Our master shed his blood for us. The least we can do is pay the price to make sure that this nation comes together because this nation was founded for the glory of God and by the glory of God. We, each of us, are descendants of this nation. And it is our prayer that we will leave the next generation with a godly inheritance. The evil one wants to take your inheritance away. They want to break it. They want to tell you, you are what you are not. But it is our choice. Many people from many nations came to this nation because of what? Freedom of bravery. Where did you receive this freedom and bravery? From the word of God, from the light of the Messiah. And it is your job, it is my job, it is our responsibility to stand together and to seek his face. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. We pray, oh God, that your name would be exalted and lifted. Let your name be lifted. I pray that this morning that each of us will respond to your call. A call, a clarion call this morning to seek your face. To go out beyond the comfort zone and to make provision for peace, for harmony and to make sure that we work together so the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob will be the winner and your name would be exalted and lifted. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand up. And this is what Hashem told Moshe to tell Aharon. I not only want to bless your people but I want to put my name upon them. And he said, 
ya era donai panavileka vihuneka isa adonai panavileka vesem leka shalom the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance upon you with his peace and with his shalom vesem yeshua hamashiach go and be blessed in the name of our master yeshua amen and amen shabbat shalom and see you all